interesting that integration could be seen as that. So here's what I want to show you and ask you about. This is a very simple practice called the Wheel of Awareness. So Dan, yeah. before we do that, can I yeah. one interruption? I know we please do. So I asked earlier when we, you know, how many people come to this through science, how many come through spirituality. And I guess I want to just sort of think about ways of knowing and not knowing. So when I talk about, um, you know, you know, you know, I'm not fetishizing any group and bring up men or old old knowledge, new knowledge. But it does say men are better at killing. It's, you know. Uh, something like 90% of the, of, of the violent deaths in our country are committed by men. Uh, so, you know, like most of the people in this room, I have a mother. Uh, she's passed, but that was, that was how I learned to love. And what I, what I want to push on is that my mother was not a mathematician, right? She had nine children. All of us, each one of us, felt like we were the favorite. Right? It's like, mm -hmm. Ray thinks he's a good job. Really me. <laughs> what I'm saying is that part of the thing is science and with spirituality. So science is like more oftentimes in the knowledge space, right? Can we put this to a formula? Spirituality is more in the felt space. So I didn't have to have, right, a formula to know my mother loved me. You didn't have to give my mother a formula to, to say, this is how you love all your children. So what I'm saying is that I think it's useful to be able to put even the, 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 uh, the rigor of science on these practices, on mindfulness, what it does to the blood pressure, what it does in terms of regulating the mind. But then also, remember, again, not to fetishize him, Buddha couldn't do math. He figured some of this stuff out without a computer, uh, without apps, without calculus. And so I just want to just make sure that as we sort of think about the scientific part of it, we also remember the other forms that have been around and continue to be around and continue to evolve that we sometimes don't fully honor. Yeah, absolutely. So um, if you look at those practices and see that almost all of them use consciousness, right? So we look at the, to, let's say, the spiritual practices of contemplative traditions and ask, well, what is consciousness? And this was fascinating to me as in recent years to get to know people who are in that, that field. Um, but even if you look at the practice of parenting, like with your mom, she had to be conscious of what she was doing. She may not have known the math of it, but she was wide awake, you know? Or psychotherapy, consciousness is needed for change they were teaching. So if you take these two ideas that integration may be the base of well-being and consciousness may be needed for change, this is going to come to the other thing in a moment, you can put those two together and say, what would happen if you integrated consciousness? So you say, well, how do you do that? So with my patients, I would say, well, we're going to differentiate the knowing of being aware from the known. And I say, how do you do that? So we walk around this table that's in the shape of this wheel and say, well, let's put the knowing in the hub, and let's put the knowns on the rim. So an example of a known would be the first five senses, right, what you see, what you hear. Basically, energy patterns from outside the body you're born into. Then you can go to the second segment, which is the interior sensations of the body. Then you can go to the third segment, which are mental activities like thoughts, emotions, memories, things like that. And even a fourth segment, which are our sense of interconnectedness, and these you can see on the rim. And then what would happen, which was so intriguing, let me see if I can get to this and show you this. Let's just skip over this for a moment. We would bend the spoke around just for fun to see what was in that hub. And this was my patients with my students who were therapists. And then ultimately I did it in these workshops where I would record the results. And this is the kind of thing people would say. So I, I teach with Jack Cornfield, and we were up in Seattle teaching. And, you know, we did this wheel, we took a break. And this guy takes the microphone, he goes, I'm a 70-year-old, just-retired Microsoft engineer. And he goes, my wife is a therapist, and she brought me here. She didn't want me sitting at home, and I was retired. And we're going, oh my God, what's going to happen? And he goes, you know that part when you bend the spoke around? And I go, yeah, I, I know that part. And then he gets really quiet. And I, it took a long time to say what I'm going to say in a short time, but he basically says, after that, something shifted in him. He goes out into the park. He sees the gardener watering the roses, and now he's crying in front of 500 people. 
And he goes, we are the water. We are the roses. We are the gardener. We're all the same. And he had never felt that before. Or I did this at a parliament in another country, which was having trouble with immigration issues. And so they had me come to do a, a, a day with them. We did the wheel. And when people turn into that hub, they have similar experiences. And one of the parliamentarians came to me after the sharing part. He goes, I didn't want to share during the break. And I said, well, OK, why not? He goes, and then he gets really quiet and teary. And he goes, I have never felt so much love before in my life. I've never felt so much connected to everything and everyone. And I said, you don't want to share it? He goes, oh, no, no, no. He goes, they, he points to his parliamentarian colleague. They would think I was weak. You know, or Elijah Cummings and I did this in Baltimore with African Americans who had never met with some white folks who were there. We brought them together in a room. We did the wheel. And then when they bent and spoke around the tension that had been there before, just melted away. And you could feel people get in touch with this love. So after doing this with 10,000 people, and now I've done it with a lot more, but I've recorded all those results. This is what I want to ask you about. That hub of pure awareness seems like it's not only awareness, but it's interconnection and love. And when people get out of the nouns of their rim and somehow drop into the verb world, maybe it's the quantum world, I don't know, but this verb world of the hub, they shift not just an idea, not just a thought, not just some mathematical scientific statement, but in their experience of being alive, they get in touch with interconnection in Baltimore, for us, it was this sense of, oh, you're black, I'm white, totally shifted after we did the wheel practice compared to what it was before. And people could then see we're all just kind of like the Pando populous forest in Utah where you have 57,000, you know, these trunks of a tree. And you go, oh, my God, 57,000 trees. But you go six inches beneath the surface and you find one root ball. And when you test the DNA, you realize it's all the same tree. It's amongst the largest and oldest living things on earth. That's kind of what we are. You're a manifestation of the same essence of me, as if we're coming from the hub. So this is where these old ancient contemplative practices, but with also modern science, come together where we can say, for whatever reason, pure awareness, interconnection, and love seem to be like three threads of one fabric of reality. And I want to see how that fits with your experience. But I think, you know, I, so I've, I've done a little of the practice and you introduced me to the work of the real early. So I think it's a beautiful practice. Um, I think people have different practices, but practices to actually help us become present uh, and to be aware of that present. Um, and so I really, I think it's actually quite beautiful and quite powerful. I also think, though, in, in, in terms of, especially Western society, that there are different ways of knowing which are important, but there are different ways of not knowing, which we actually ignore largely. Um, and when I think about the anxiety associated with trying to be a category, trying to be a thing, and the anxiety comes because we can't quite pull it off. You know, people talk about feeling like a frog. Uh, and, and, and I want to even suggest that having a rigid, stable self creates Tremendous anxiety right there. Like having an illusion that that's what I'm supposed to create. Right. And it yeah. takes a lot of work. Yeah. Um, and so, um, and that's why this thing can go from no self realization, which then can relax into not having to control, not having to know, to self realization is a big move. Well, can I, let me ask you about that, because that word self is tricky, and I know we have to stop in just a minute, but. How would you feel the idea is more like no separate self-realization so that our selfing experience, let's say, for all of us in this room right now, is happening. We don't have to say there's no self, but there's actually a selfing emergence that is not limited to these skin and case bodies, but that's happening within and between. I well, know. certainly I think that's much closer. Part of it is, is for me, for I think, in, in, consistent with your practices, we don't want to just have an idea, we want to have practice, we want to have the experience. Mm -hmm. And so, I don't think we disappear, um, 
But I, my understanding of no self-realization is the self as we think of it. Yes. You know, the permanent, stable, uh, separate self is an illusion. Mm -hmm. Does it mean that everything is an illusion? No. Uh, but can we relax into the space where there, and as you say, and, and actually experience the self in process. Uh, and the self in process calls different selves forward. Uh, there's an African concept of the self is made up of 100 people sitting around the table. And then when someone comes up, they appoint someone. They say, OK, Dan, they want to talk about science. You go out there and talk to them. That's what you're good at. And then it's like, OK, they want to talk about raising kids. Fred, you go talk to them. So they have the concept that they have these different selves or self, these modules, and they the world calls different ones forward. But the one doesn't yeah. assume that I'm in. Yeah. They're part of this larger process. Uh, so I think, yeah, I, I think if I understand you correctly, I'm not suggesting that there's no identity, there's no self at all. But I think that our Western concepts of self is so rigid, it's so categorized, that even the idea of self being yeah. is a stretch. Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I think it's a good stretch. Mm -hmm. I think it's a stretch that we should all make. And I think if we can make that stretch, we can relax into the flow. We can start to relax into our awareness. And, you know, this is so beautiful. You, you brought up in your wonderful talk about Ubuntu and that I am because we are. And I have, you know, this uh, uh, you know, to drive to see how together we can all work mm -hmm. to bring this non way of being othering into the world, how we can collectively start doing this. You know, there's a fun term of me in the body and we in the between this, and we can talk about we or the larger we, but this body wants to thank this body for having the courage to come up and do something we've never done before. Well, I want to so, thank this body and everybody. Thank you so much.